copies of the Confession, chapter 16, as we continue our way through studying chapter 16 in the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is our article of faith here at Brookside Baptist Church. We've been considering the biblical doctrine of good works for some time now, and we're going to read just the second paragraph of chapter 16 together again. Second paragraph of chapter 16, and let's, uh, if you, well, I guess I don't know if we all have the same uh, modern translation, so I guess I'll just read it. I was going to say we can read this also together, but I'll just read it out loud, because I know some of us have different translations or modernizations. Paragraph 2 of chapter 16. These good works, done in obedience to God's commandments, are the fruit and evidence of a true and living faith. Through good works, believers express their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, build up their brothers and sisters, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouths of opponents, and glorify God. Believers are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, so that they bear fruit, leading to holiness and have the outcome, eternal life. Let's begin by going to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, as always, as every moment, but perhaps being more aware of it in times as these, uh, times like these when we must be granted understanding of what you have revealed, <clears throat> we stand in every way in need of you, physically, spiritually, and we are in need of grace, in need of you know, your mercy and, and patience and forbearance as we are sometimes slow to hear. We are in, in need of your strength to carry out that which we have heard. We thank you for this opportunity now to hear uh, a summary in the confession, and then from your word, uh, explanation <clears throat> of this great doctrine of good works that you have shown us is what pleases you in, in, in the lives of your saints. And I ask that, that, they, that this people, that this congregation, this local assembly would be one who is mighty in good works. Not setting these things aside as, as trivial or uh, inconsequential, but seeing the great importance they are. That we are to be defined as a people zealous for good works. That, that ought to be one of the most evident things about us, and may it be so here at Brookside Baptist Church. In accordance with your will and pleading your grace and trusting your favor toward us in Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. And so, so far, if you've been with us, you know that um, we have been going through this chapter on good works. We've already established that good works are only, exclusively, those works that are defined by God, divinely defined, right? Uh, so we don't just get to come up with whatever we want and then call it a good work. Um, I can stand on my head all day. That's not been commanded by God in his word, so it's not a good work. At least not in and of itself, maybe in some way it could be seen as a good work. Um, but we, we can come up with all sorts of things, and, and men often do. Uh, men throughout the ages have devised, have imagined whatever they uh, might see as profitable, and practiced it themselves or insisted upon it uh, from others. <clears throat> but unless it has the warrant of Scripture, it is not a good work. It is not a good work. We established that. Uh, we, so we, we, we established that good works are divinely defined. We established what our motivation ought to be in good works. Uh, above all else, before all else, around all else, under all else, our motivation for good works ought to be a love for Jesus Christ, who died so that he would have a people who are zealous for good works. This is, the, this is why he laid down his life, so that you, each one of you here today who are proclaiming his name, have taken his name upon yourself, would be zealous for 
good works. And so that is above all the motivation that we ought to have in our good works. And we saw that uh, good works in relation to our salvation have nothing at all to do with our justification, but everything to do with our sanctification. Good works do not save us. There's not a single good work that has anything to do with how we are made right with God, how we are justified before a holy God. Nothing that we can do, nothing to the table of salvation that we bring, only to the cross of Jesus Christ do we cling, right? We, we brought, from our perspective, that which was necessary, which has been often said, are our sin. And Jesus Christ brought all else. And good works have nothing to do with our justification. If we say otherwise, if we say that we have to do something to be saved, we, we have to um, commit a work. We can call it whatever we want to. We can call it by other names. But if we have to do something to be saved, then the work of Jesus Christ is insufficient. What we're saying is that what Jesus Christ did was insufficient. That he lied when he was on the cross and said, it is finished. But praise God, that is not so. Amen. Those words are true and they remain true today. He, did, he, he finished the work that was necessary for us to be reconciled, sinners, to be reconciled with the Holy God. He did all that was necessary. And so the relation of good works to our salvation has nothing to do with our justification, but has everything to do with our sanctification. Those who are we're not saved by good works, but those who are truly saved will carry out good works. The same Holy Spirit who, who saves you, who justifies you, will also sanctify you. And, and that's going to look like greater conformity in the image of Jesus Christ. And with that, we've also seen that there are, are several uses given in the confession for good works. And, and these are just further motivations for our obedience to be uh, to the command to be a people of good works. There are, uh, e even on top of this great and preeminent and first motivation of love for Jesus Christ, there are secondary motivations in seeing the usefulness of good works. We saw already that it is by good works, as we just read in paragraph 2, it is by good works that believers express their thankfulness to God. That's very useful. If you're a Christian here today, you, you desire to show the God that you claim saved you from eternal wrath and damnation. You desire to show him your gratitude for that, to show him that you're thankful for saving you. And so you ought to see good works as very useful under that heading. Praise God, I get to show him, my God, the one who saved me, that I'm thankful. And we do that by our good works. Uh, and this is, this is the only way that we can love God truly according to the first greatest commandment, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. For if we, if we did good works to get anything from God, that would not be agape love. That would not be pure love, not selfless love, as we're, or as we're commanded to love God. It would be loving someone to get something in return, right? How many of you would appreciate that? If you found out that somebody was loving you, was, was doing things for you just because they were going to get something in return, and you, would, you would say that's not really love, right? Love is selfless. Love uh, puts oneself um, after the needs and desires of the other person. And so because what Christ has done is perfect and sufficient and nothing is left needed to be done for our justification, we can now express thankfulness Truly to God. We can love him. True love, agape love, not because we want to get anything, but because we already have everything in Jesus Christ. We can show God gratitude through our good works. And then second, we saw that through good works, believers strengthen their assurance. Are you one who often doubts whether or not you're truly in the faith? Are you one who questions uh, whether you have truly laid hold of Jesus Christ? Perhaps it is because you are weak in good works. Perhaps it's because you are weak in good works. Our assurance grows with our obedience to be a people who are zealous for good works. It's really rather simple. Uh, it's, no wonder if, it's no wonder that you wonder if you're a Christian if you're not acting like one. Why, why should you wonder if you are a Christian if you're not acting like one? And so one of the great uses of good works is that they strengthen our assurance. We, not because we think we're so good. Oh, man, I must be a Christian because look at all these great things I'm doing. No but because this clearly must be a work of God because I'm a wretch in myself, and if, this, if these good works are being done by me, then this is evidence that the, the holy God is at work in me. So these are the things that we've seen so far. We're working through the uses of good works that we see in paragraph 2 of chapter 16. And today we're going to cover two more, just two more uses. And you've already read them 
One of the next uses of good works given by the confession from the Word of God is that by them, by our good works, we build one another up. Through good works, believers build up their brothers and sisters. In Ephesians chapter 4, you can turn there in your Bibles and follow along. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, urges his readers, in verse 1, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they were called. To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they were called. And then he describes this worthy walking, if you will. He describes it as one that is marked by humility, this is verse 2, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one, one another in love, and eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what, that's what a worthy walking is. If you're a Christian and you want to walk worthily, this is what it will look like. And then Paul goes on to explain why they ought to be so eager to maintain this unity. Why should a Christian care about Christian unity? Can't a Christian just be an island unto himself? Isn't that a thing? We don't really need the church, right? We can just gather when we want to. I can have church out in the, on the woods by myself. I can be an island to myself. Right, Paul? Well, what is Paul's answer? Rhetorically, no. No, you cannot. You cannot be a Christian who is a, an island unto himself. At least, you cannot be a, a mature Christian. That is impossible. It is impossible to be a mature Christian who intentionally separates himself from the body of Christ to be an island to himself. For it is within the context of the community of believers that the Lord Jesus Christ has intended and provided for the equipping of the individual saint. This is where our Lord, our King, Jesus Christ, has intended for you to grow within the context of the church, not by yourself. That's not where you're going to mature. That's not where you're going to grow. It is in Zion that the Lord has commanded blessing. Psalm 133 and verse 3. God has commanded his blessing not just everywhere, but in this pe pe peculiar way, in this particular way, in Zion, in the church. Christ has given the apostles and prophets and evangelists by his word and the shepherds and teachers of the local church to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. This is within the context of the local church that this is done. Within the bulwark of the church, the believer is safe from the waves that would toss him to one doctrine and fro another, and from the winds that would carry him about by human cunning and craftiness in deceitful schemes, as Paul goes on to explain there in Ephesians chapter 4. The walls of the church are mightier than those of Jericho. The armies of darkness could march around Zion carrying the very gates of hell, and they would not prevail against it. Seventy times seven circuits and all the trumpets of Abaddon would not suffice to shake loose even the smallest pebble from the edifice of the true church. In short, this is where the, the, the true Christian, the maturing Christian, is going to be safe and growing, is in, is in the context of the church. This is by the design of Jesus Christ himself to have. You don't get to decide. None of us get to decide where we're going to grow, where we're going to receive the blessing of God. I mean, we really think about how prideful that is, that we would tell the one who blesses us with blessings that we don't deserve where we will be blessed and how we will be blessed. No, King Jesus has determined this already. He has determined where we will be blessed, how we will be blessed, and it is within the context of the church. Like the human body, the strength of the part is derived from and dependent upon the whole. Verse 15. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. That's verse 15, verse 16. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow 
so that it builds itself up in love. So again, like the human body, the strength of a part is derived from dependent, dependent upon the whole. A Christian, you, each of you here today, your strength, your spiritual growth is dependent upon the body of Christ, is dependent upon the whole. You require it. The same analogy is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can turn there quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll read verses 12 through 27. Same analogy here from Paul again. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. As he chose. He arranged them. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. The strength of the body is dependent upon that of the individual member, and the strength of the member is derived from that of the whole. That's how it works. One part affects the body, and the body affects the one part. Anyone who has had an injury of any sort, really, from children, you can understand this as a very simple concept. From the smallest injury to the, the, the most egregious, you can understand this simple analogy. Those who are more advanced in years can perhaps even understand it better. A weak knee, a sore back, a migraine, a bruise, a cut, a broken bone. Any one of these ailments have such an impact on the body that at times it can render the whole, the whole body incapacitated. It could just be just a sore back, if any of you have ever experienced that, or a hurt knee just one part of your body, but you're not able to go to work for the week. So it is with the body of Christ. So it is with the body of Christ. One member impacts the body, and the body impacts every member. One erring member, one brother caught in a trespass, one sister overcome by grief, and those who are true members of the body of Christ almost don't need to be reminded of the command to weep with those who weep, Romans 12, 15, or as we just read in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. If you're truly part of the body, you don't have to remind your hand that your body is suffering when the foot hurts. Right? Your whole body knows it because you're, you're connected. In the same way, if you're truly a member of the body of Christ, you don't have to be reminded to mourn with those who mourn, to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice because you're a part of that body. You're affected by the suffering of one. On the other hand, when one member stands firm in the truth, when a brother in Christ is strong under pressure, like the sword arm of a warrior, when a sister in Christ gracefully endures trials like an army's banner in the midst of the battle, then those who are true members of the body of Christ don't need to be prompted to rejoice with those who rejoice, 
For the joy of one is the joy of all. How many tides of war have been turned by the action of one? From fiction to nonfiction, there could be so many examples of the act of one warrior changing the tide uh, of the entire battle. As, as the rest of the army looks on and sees his gallantry, his, his, his intrepidity under, under insurmountable odds, right? And what seemed to be a loss, it becomes a gain. Did not the hearts of the Israelites melt like wax until David did the good work of decapitating the Philistine giant? Would not our hearts fail similarly, similarly had not Christ beheaded the giants of sin and death by his good work on the cross? And Christian, you have in this, in this doctrine, in good works, as in all things, a preeminent example in your Lord. He is the example. We're not asking you to be to pursue some standard other than who Christ is. We're simply describing to you who Jesus Christ is, one who was devoted to good works, whose good works built up his disciples during his earthly ministry, and whose good works continue to build up his church two millennia later. What changes were wrought in the fishermen of Galilee? These uneducated common men, as they're described in Acts 4.13, went from living lives of relative obscurity to that of shaking empires. Why? As they will go on to say in Acts 4.13, these uneducated men had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. They had seen his good works. They had seen his miracles. They had, they had heard him. They were brought before governors and kings as their Lord told them beforehand that they would be. Matthew chapter 10.18, and they bore witness before them. They had been built up by the one who was perfect in good works. And century after century, it has been the same. Ever since our Lord's earthly ministry, it has been the same. Men and women converted by the gospel have studied the life of their king, whose good works built them up to be bastions of charity and love for fellow man in their generations. In the name of Jesus Christ, the poor have been fed, Widows and orphans have been cared for. Slavery has been abolished. Prisons have been reformed. Righteous laws have been instituted. And oppression, the oppressed have been liberated. And you, Christian, bear the name of Christ. You bear his name. You have the privilege of sharing, then, in this great heritage. By your good works begun in Jesus Christ and continuing through his body, the world is changed. His kingdom goes forth. His gospel is advanced. You may never stand, and I was thinking about this, uh, this assembly before today, and I was thinking... On one hand, I might say you may never stand before governors and kings, but on the other hand, it's very possible you may be. It's very possible many of you may not be called to stand before governors and kings to bear witness for Jesus Christ, but honestly, it's not uh, unimaginable that some of you may be called to do that. But many of you may never help pass legislation or open an orphanage. You may not do great and mighty things as men would measure them. But as Gandalf the Grey wisely concluded, it is the small, everyday deed of ordinary folks that keeps the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. I think as students of the Reformation, we sometimes forget that we're not probably going to be the one nailing theses on church doors in Wittenberg. We're probably not going to be queen for nine days and then beheaded for the cause of Christ. But it is the calling of every Christian, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, to do all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Each one.
All of us are called to, to this, are privileged to this, and in our, in our being students of that great heritage, I think we can sometimes neglect that. We can sometimes forget the, the actions of the mother in caring for the children and caring for the home are, in a sense, as, as mighty, as wonderful, as useful, as beautiful in the sight of God as what Luther did. He doesn't need either. He's not impressed by the works of men. But as he places you in your context and with your responsibilities, he delights in you as you carry out your daily duties for his glory. And from that perspective, Luther was just doing what he was called to do in the moment he was called to do it, just as the apostles did what they were called to do when they were called to do it. And you are doing what you've been called to do when you go out and serve your family, men, by providing for them, and by laboring for them. These are things done to the glory of God, good works, privileges for us to do that our God is as intimately aware of and delights in as what we tend to think of as the great actions of men. You have the opportunity, the privilege, the duty, by your good works to build up your brothers and sisters who are sitting next to you this afternoon. All this to say, all this I was trying to get at with explaining that we're all part of one body, no one's an island, there's no loner Christians, your good works build up your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so you, who are, who are here today, you have the opportunity to do that toward one another, to build each other up. Do not underestimate the influence you have, both for good and for ill, over one another. I won't ask you to physically look around, but I wonder if I I wrote that, and then I'm wondering if perhaps it might not be a good thing to do. To look around you at one another, but with your mind's eye at least, look upon those whom you call brother and sister here at Brookside. Think of them. Think of their names. They have names. They have faces. Do you love them? They are individual souls, precious in the sight of God. They have their hopes and dreams and cares and concerns and burdens and wounds strengths and weaknesses. They're sitting to your left and to your right and to your front and to your back. We are inherently selfish creatures. We tend to think of the world as revolving around us. That's our, our natural bent is to think that the world revolves around us. We often live as if other people are like actors in a play starring me. Or like characters in a video game, we, we can always use the practice of coming out of ourselves. A reminder to come out of ourselves. Remember, we're not the center. This is not all about us. There is a soul, <clears throat> probably only feet from me, with great needs, and, and over whom I have great potential influence. So think of that. You have the ability to influence these precious souls for good by building them up with your good works according to the word of God. You have that ability, you have that influence over one another to, to encourage them, to build them up for good. These fellow blood-bought Christians. I had here a, a parenthetical statement. You have the ability to affect them for good or by your sin or neglect you have the ability to affect them for ill. <clears throat> There's no such thing as a private sin in the body of Christ, and that might be a good thing to spend our time on at some point. But since our focus is how we can positively influence the brethren by our good works, so I want to keep the focus there, recognizing that the antithesis is true. We also affect one another negatively by our sins, by our neglect. We're called to let our good works be seen by others, and, and who needs to be who needs to see them the most? But our brothers and sisters in Christ in our local church, that they may give glory to our Father who is in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. What a privilege good works are. And that verse, which forms a somewhat fitting conclusion to the first point of the lecture, also provides the basis for the second, the second use today, would be now the fourth use. <coughs> Fourth use of good works. Believers, by their good works, adorn the profession of the gospel. By our good works, we're called to adorn 
the profession of the gospel. Again, as we just read or alluded to, Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. How do we let our light shine? What does that look like? By doing good works. How are men going to glorify our Father in heaven? By, by our good works, by seeing our light through our good works. We adorn the gospel. We adorn what we profess to believe by our good works. You who are here today, do you desire to be more godly? To be more God-like? Is it your pursuit to more accurately image the one in whose image you were made? Then you will adorn the gospel with your good works. If that is your desire, if that is your pursuit, if you, if you long for greater godliness, then one thing you must do is adorn the gospel with your good works. Why? Because God adorned the gospel with his. Because he adorns the gospel with his good works. Even from the Proto-Evangelium, the first issuance of the gospel, the Proto-Evangelium as it's been called. From then, from the very beginning, the first declaration of the gospel, good works have always adorned the good news of Jesus Christ. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Paradise has been lost. Mankind has fallen into darkness. It seemed beyond all hope. Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. Instead of devotion, they chose rebellion. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they had been commanded not to eat, and the conditions of their covenant with God were violated, and the penalty of death was levied. But post tenebris lux, out of darkness, light. Verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done all of this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. By these words, the Lord God foretold the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would crush the devil, though he himself would be bruised on the cross. Jesus shall his great arm reveal, Jesus the woman's conquering seed. Though now the serpent bruise his heel, Jesus shall bruise the serpent's head. Another poem written from Adam's perspective. Then the wind came through the orchard, throwing dust across the field. The serpent's food, our final shroud. And yet I glimpsed within that cloud a servant's striking heel. For each of my hearers today who have not yet put their trust in the head crusher in Jesus Christ, do so today while God has given you time. For Jesus Christ shall still the proud Philistines noise, baffle the sons of unbelief, nor long permit them to rejoice, but turn their triumph into grief. Do you think that you can withstand what a fallen archangel could not? Jesus Christ lived a perfectly righteous life, died a perfectly sufficient death, bore in his body the sins of his people as a substitute, was buried, rose again on the third day, ascended, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, ever living to intercede for those who seek forgiveness through him. Turn to Christ today and live. Our God adorned the Proto-Evangelium, the first issuance of the gospel with good works. First, he cursed the serpent. The curse of the serpent itself was an adornment of the gospel. 
It was a good work, a, a kindness toward all mankind, and especially towards those who believed. It was a demonstration of the willingness and ability of God to carry out what he had promised to do. He showed his power over his enemy, even then, so that his people would know that final and ultimate victory would be accomplished. Even the cursing of the serpent was an adornment upon the gospel. Men often make promises that, whether by good or evil intentions, are not fulfilled. Not so with God. He has and will always keep his promises. And he adorned his gospel, his promise of a Messiah, with a demonstration that he would keep his word to send one who would crush the head of the serpent. Second, God adorned his gospel with the good work of clothing Adam and Eve. He clothed Adam and Eve, Genesis 3.21, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. He adorned the Proto-Evangelium with the good work of clothing Adam and Eve. Though they had rebelled against him, he clothed them. He covered their shame. Some think that God actually sacrificed for them since he gave them garments of skin. But he loved those who had played the part of his enemies, and therefore we are called to be perfect even as our Heavenly Father is perfect, Matthew 5, 48. Whether or not he did that, whether or not we know what, where, how he procured the skins of the animals, we know that what he did was an act of kindness to those who had just shown him hatred. It was a good work of, of covering the shame of Adam and Eve by their garments. And third, God adorned his gospel with the good work of stationing an angel with a flaming sword at the entrance to the garden to bar the way to the tree of life. This is Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. It is likely that had Adam and Eve access to the tree of life, they would have lived forever, but in a cursed condition. They just would have lived perpetually, but always under this curse. And so it was a mercy of God to keep them from the tree so that they might pass from death to life. Had mankind never ceased to eat from the tree of life, would we ever have eaten of the bread of life that is Christ? I know that I border on mysteries here and secret things that belong only to the Lord. But we know, we can know, that it was a good work for God to bar the way to the tree of life because he did it. And it was therefore an adornment of the gospel. Our God, the living and true God, the one who, whose image we are to bear, we are to show to the world, this is, this is God. He, from the beginning, has adorned his gospel with good works, and we are called to do the same. We are called to not be those who merely speak, but those who do. As the Apostle John calls us not to love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth, 1 John 3, 18, for the latter is how our God loves. Our God loves in deed and in truth. Let us not merely speak the gospel, which even demons can do, but adorn it with good works. Let us adorn the gospel with good works as our God has done. When John the Baptist asked for confirmation that Jesus was the Messiah, the object of the gospel, when, when John sent uh, his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one? Our Lord did not respond simply, yes, because I said so. 
Can I simply speak, uh, go back to John and just say, yes, I am. No, he said, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5. Our God has always been the one who adorns his gospel with good works. And so likewise, when men ask if our gospel is true, is, this, is your Messiah, Jesus Christ, the one? May we be able to respond with the adorn, adornments we have by the grace of God given. May we be able to respond with our own adornments. But the hungry are fed, widows and orphans are clothed, men are treated with fairness and neighborly consideration. The gospel is proclaimed. See how we love one another. And hear us sing. Come, glorious Lord, the rebels spurn. Scatter thy foes, victorious King. And Gath and Ascalon shall mourn, and all the sons of God shall sing. Shall magnify the sovereign grace of him that sits upon the throne. And earth and heaven conspire to praise Jehovah and his conquering Son. Let's pray. Almighty God, we ask that in accordance with your work in us, with your will that you have revealed for your people, that we would be those who are zealous for good works, that we would be here at Brookside. Now we, we continue to heap prayer upon prayer as we study these doctrinal truths. We thank you for them. We thank, you, we thank you that we know we can never ask for too much, but we ask on top of what we have already requested, that we would be a people who build each other up with our, our good works and a people who adorn your gospel as you have with good works. May we not be those who merely speak as words are cheap. May we be willing to, even at great expense, beautify, make desirable even, present to the world the gospel that you have entrusted to us. As we go out this week, may my brothers and sisters be encouraged in their task. May they know that you are with them. Each of us have a greater view of Christ, and if that is given to us, then everything else will follow. May we love him who first loved us. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.